Hi everyone, my name is Rochelle and I'm the Home Garden Program Manager at Valley Verde and I would like to welcome you to our October uh, video for the Home Gardening Program. So um, before we go over our overview for uh, today's lesson, I uh, just wanted to remind you that by now you should have cleared out um, your bed from the summer and spring seedlings. Um, I know that some of them were probably still producing, but uh, we'd really like to give you the full scope of what it's like to plant in both spring and winter or fall uh, so that you can learn the techniques. And then in the future, if you decide um, to just extend your summer garden and not do the fall planting, that's your choice, but we want to um, really teach you the skills to be successful at both because there's some differences um, in what you do and the needs uh, based on the weather and um, the needs of the plants and what thrives in this fall weather. So uh, if you have not done so already, please uh, clear your uh, beds um, and you'll probably want at least two weeks if you're adding fresh compost to your garden beds before they're ready for the seedlings um, because the seedlings are young and the roots um, are young and uh, new they're more sensitive to um, the nitrogen and um, the fertilizers in the compost so you really want to allow it to settle for a week or two prior to putting your uh, new baby seedlings in the ground so be sure to give yourself some time. So if you haven't done it already, it's the beginning of October, we'll be planting in about a week and a half. So do it now, do it this weekend um, or this week actually. Uh, so let's see. And you know, don't forget to, you can compost um, anything that doesn't have seeds on it or disease or weeds. Uh, so be sure to do that if you have any of your leftover summer plants. Okay, so for our brief review, um, we are going to go over our uh, September content just as a little refresher. We will be doing our nutrition and health topic, which is on sugars and diabetes. Uh, our garden topic is cool weather plants and care. So that's going to be teaching you about the fall garden, fall winter. And uh, our climate change topic will be transportation and pollution. And then uh, we have a some climate change action steps that you can take to protect our environment and uh, do your part. So, and then we'll end with announcements. Right. Okay, so for our September review, uh, we talked about last month winter garden preparation and seed saving. So uh, we did encourage you to clear your beds last month um, and to save seeds so that you aren't dependent, oops, excuse me, I shook my computer, uh, so that you're not dependent on um, purchasing each year. If you buy open pollinated seeds, you will be able to save them. So, so for our nutrition and health topic in September, we learned about vitamins and minerals. You can see the charts on uh, the left of your screen here. Uh, we've got um, so there are 14, I know the picture says 12, but there's actually 14 essential vitamins and 14 essential minerals that may be listed on the nutrition labels uh, of the foods you eat. This would be store-bought um, foods that have a package label on them. Um, so eating a rainbow so of different colored fruits and vegetables will ensure that you are ingesting enough of these nutrients that your body needs to be healthy. Make it your goal to eat the rainbow each day if possible or each week. Use the chart in last month's handout to track your progress. Suggestion uh, would be to make it a family challenge or a competition to see who eats the most colors throughout the week. And you can tally up and say, I ate 27 different colors this week, you know, for each day. Um, not that they're different colors, but each day there's like an opportunity to maybe do seven or eight colors in the food groups. And so, um, you can go through and add up for one week total, how many days were you able to max out all the color groups. Uh, for our garden topic, as I mentioned, we talked about um, being sure to save seeds from the plant in your summer garden. So you're gonna wanna label them with the date of the harvest and the name of the seeds and store the envelope 
So in a paper envelope in a cool, dark place. You really don't want to put them in plastic. Uh, you can store in jars. I would recommend if you have the amber colored jars, the darker brown, um, that's ideal. And or just store them in a cupboard uh, that's cool, dry, dark. That's the most ideal. Um, conditions. If you happen to have those silica packets that come sometimes in uh, brand new shoes or um, different items that you purchase from the store, there's these little packets of silica um, and that actually helps remove moisture and that's good because that's going to preserve your seeds because what activates a seed is when it absorbs water and so it's more likely to last longer if um, if you have those silica packets in there. But storing in a cool, dry place is, is also helpful and good. So, you know, not under your sink, not in your bathroom, just, you know, somewhere in a pantry that's cool and dry. Okay, so for our climate change topic last month, let me move screen up here. Um, we talked about choosing open pollinated seeds. Uh, to ensure you can save seeds from season, season to season. And this will enable you to save money, increase biodiversity, and reduce dependence on big agricultural industries who produce ma mass amounts of seeds, which lack diversity. And this makes crops more susceptible to disease and pests. So you want a diverse garden. You don't wanna do monocropping. You want to get different varieties, um, of course. Um, you need to think about, you know, some things might get cross-pollinated. And so I, the diversity is not within like different types of broccoli, but it would be broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, mm -hmm. garlic. So you're, you're having diverse um, seeds in your garden and different herbs and different plants. Um, you do need to be careful like with corn. If you have corn growing you want to pick one type of corn um, because it's wind pollinated and so um, if there's any other corn growing within a mile of your house it will you know not necessarily breed true to type um, you can still save the seeds but it might kind of adjust over time if your neighbors are also growing corn in a different type so the diversity is more about different types of plants than uh, multiple of the same type of plant if that makes sense okay um, and as you save seeds from year to year, they're slowly going to adapt to your microclimate and over time better adapt to the environmental conditions in your region. When saved for several generations, these seeds become known as heirloom seeds. Uh, and so we really want to, um, to work on not being, we want to work on independence. Uh, for our food system. And so the more you can grow, the less you can depend on the big agricultural companies, which really the only way they are able to do what they do on such a large scale is using chemicals and GMO products and uh, or seeds. And um, that's just really not what's best for our environment or for our health. So um, we can do our part to reduce that environmental impact and improve our health. Okay, so moving on, our health and nutrition topic is sugar and diabetes. So earlier this year, we learned about carbohydrates. Um, so, okay, so we have an FDA handout. Let me grab that. So this is from the Food and Drug Administration, um, and this would be attached in your email. And so this is what we're gonna be um, kind of referencing, and there's a backside with some action steps. So we're gonna be learning about sugars, um, added sugars in particular. So sugars are the smallest form of carbohydrates and they are the easiest to digest. Our body breaks sugars down into glucose, which can be used as energy or stored in the body. If you eat too many calories from sugar, you will not get enough nutrients that are essential for your body to function properly. Remember the vitamins and minerals we discussed previously. So while staying within the recommended calorie intake each day, sugars are naturally present in foods like milk and fruit. These sugars are part of a healthy diet. What we need to limit are the added sugars. Added sugars sneak into many common foods from bread, peanut butter, cereal, condiments like salad dressing and ketchup, baked goods and other processed foods. These sugars add calories to make the food taste more desirable or to preserve it. For optimal health, we need to limit the amount of sugar in our diet. 
Too much glucose, which is sugar, in the blood can lead to obesity and other health problems like diabetes or prediabetes. Reducing your intake of added sugars can also reduce your risk for cardiovascular or heart disease, according to the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. Okay. my little screen up here so you can see better. Okay, so diabetes and prediabetes are serious health conditions. Type 1 diabetes is usually genetic and caused by an autoimmune response where the body's unable to make and store insulin. People with type 1 diabetes must take insulin and the condition is lifelong. Type 1 is usually diagnosed in children or young adults. In contrast, type 2 diabetes is usually diagnosed in adults over 45 years old. Type 2 causes, its cause is unknown, but it's thought to be related to genetics, so a family history, obesity, inactivity, and older age. Treatment for type 2 usually involves medication, diet, exercise, and sometimes insulin. Diabetes uh, prevents the body from being able to use glucose or sugar in the blood. Thus, blood sugar levels rise to dangerous levels and can cause long-term damage to the body if not treated properly. Examples of long-term damage from diabetes include nerve, eye, and kidney damage. So there are some risk factors um, for developing type 2 diabetes. Uh, and so I'll list those for you here. So if an immediate family member has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you're at a higher risk. If you are a smoker, your chances are 30 to 40 percent higher than if you're not smoking. Um, if you are over the age of 45, your risk increases. If you are physically inactive or sedentary, if you are overweight or obese, and in particular belly fat, so fat in your stomach area, is strongly linked with diabetes. Women who've had gestational diabetes during pregnancy are at a little higher risk. And unfortunately, if you are Black, Latino, American Indian, Alaska Native, Pacific Islander, or Asian American, you are more likely to have diabetes. So. Um, thankfully, though, type 2 diabetes can be reversed or controlled with changes in diet and regular exercise, as well as monitoring your blood sugar levels, quitting smoking if applicable, and taking medication if necessary. It's never too late to start taking care of your body. So at Valley Verde, you know, we're all about gardening, but we also care about your health and improving um, the quality of your life and we want strong healthy communities that are resilient and part of that means um, taking care of our bodies and our health. Okay, so this is interesting if you look at the um, graphic on your right about what sugar does to your body and your brain. Um, so just a couple things that I'll point out here, um, the picture of the heart. Uh, studies have shown a worrisome connection between sugar and both high blood pressure and heart disease. So I mentioned that earlier. Um, then the next one down, excess sugar intake is strongly associated with weight gain, even in people who exercise regularly. So I'm Swedish, I have a sweet tooth. <laughs> um, so I need to work on that. Um, you know, it's easy. There's, it's hard because sweet um, and processed foods are the cheaper foods and they taste good and they're addictive, um, but they're, really not good for us and so um, we need to prioritize our health and the thing is once you get used to a pattern of not having it your body adjusts and it no longer craves those things unless you happen to go to a party and um, get reintroduced then it's kind of a process of like trying to wean yourself off of the, sh the excess sugar and stuff um, but um, it's something for all of us to work on and um, just to improve our health. Obviously, sugar is linked with cav uh, to developing cavities, um, which can also affect other health systems in your body when you have gum disease or tooth decay. Um, so uh, over here, the, uh, 
on the, the chart on the right with the picture of the apple, it says the amount of sugar naturally found in a healthy diet frequently from fruits and vegetables can provide some of the energy needed to get through the day. So sugar is not bad. Natural sugars uh, give you that quick burst of energy. Um, but what we want to avoid are the added sugars, which really just end up accumulating as extra body fat um, and um, overworking our heart when you have fat surrounding your heart muscle, um, it has to work harder to pump. And so that's why it can lead to heart disease. So, uh, and then on the left here, we just have uh, common uh, food products that uh, sugars are often hidden in. And so ready to eat breakfast cereal, uh, condiments uh, like ketchup and mustard and different um, sauces and soups, frozen yogurt, smoothies, salad dressings, um, bread, unfortunately, um, tinned baked beans, and instant oats. So really what you want to do is read your labels and check to see if there's added sugar and try to go for the one that does not or buy it in its raw uh, form and prepare it yourself. Okay, so um, this is just a little infographic uh, to kind of summarize um, some of the symptoms um, and indicators that you might have um, to talk to your doctor about whether or not you have diabetes. So um, some symptoms might be that you're always hungry, uh, interestingly, unexplained weight loss uh, because your body's um, not able to properly regulate itself um, and not able to um, digest the sugars. And so they're building up in your blood and you're not digesting them, you're not using them. Um, so you might lose weight, but you're actually um, in trouble <laughs> from uh, other health uh, effects. So you, like it said, it, you can develop nerve uh, damage. So the tingling in your hands and feet can be a symptom. Um, if you have to use the bathroom and uh, to urinate frequently, uh, that could be a symptom. Uh, let's see, um, sexual disorder, extreme fatigue, and always being thirsty. These are kind of some signs that you could have prediabetes or diabetes. Um, complications, so if you have it and it's untreated, um, it can lead to candida, or candida, which is like a yeast infection, wounds that don't heal very well, um, they're healing slowly, peripheral neuropath, so that's like um, where the nerves in your feet um, aren't working correctly, your, maybe your feet are always cold. Um, the cerebrovascular disease, so that's uh, potential for blood clotting in your vein, or in your brain, excuse me, um, diabetic nephropathy, I'm not sure what that one is, um, coronary heart disease and eye damage. So, and then the prevention is exercise, eating healthy food, avoiding the processed, um, you know, drive-through fast foods, um, added sugars, and then just go to your doctor and get checked out. I know it can be scary, um, but if you stay on top of it, you can be in control of it and it won't control you. Uh, so I encourage you to just talk to your doctor. And um, uh, if you do know that you have it, check your blood um, sugars daily and maybe more than daily um, so that's that okay so now we're going to move on to our cool weather plants and care so in the same way that we use square foot garden gardening method for our spring plants we want to divide our garden space into 12 squares um, 12 inches wide by 12 inches long so Oh, sorry, not 12 squares, uh, 12 inches. So um, you're all going to be receiving a grid. And this grid, for most people, um, you have the eight feet by four feet grids. Um, so you'll be using this big, larger one on top. Some people have the smaller four by four grids. Uh, and so it's going to tell you what to plant in that box and how many of the plant should be in that box because. Um, I also included this reference. This is more generic, but this just explains why um, this would be in your attachments in your email. This explains why um, 
you put a certain number of plants in each square and how to space them. Um, so this kind of just explains the method a little bit more of square foot gardening. And then uh, this handout that I made will have on one side, it'll have your grid so you'll know where to place it. It's actually important to place it um, as best you can in the order on here because we tried to do companion planting where certain plants that are next to each other will help each other and certain plants that would steal nutrients from each other are spaced further apart. So for example, on here I have nasturtium, which is a flower, and it's right next to Brussels sprouts um, in between them. And so the reason that's helpful is because it's going to draw aphids away from the Brussels sprouts, and um, it will help keep them from getting over infested. You still will probably have um, to deal with some aphids, but um, the nasturtium is kind of a sacrificial plant. It's also edible. Um, the leaves and the flowers are edible. So that's an example. Another example would be having your onions and your garlic next to carrots. And the reason that's helpful is because the smell of the onion and garlic is going to deter what's called um, the carrot fly. Uh, I think it's like a white fly, um, but it, it lays eggs and the little larva will burrow holes through your carrots. So the smell of the onions and the garlic is going to deter those carrot flies uh, from damaging your crop. So it's important to try to follow the layout of the grid because there's actually um, a method to why we put certain things in certain places. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, you can Google companion planting. Um, maybe we'll do a separate video on that sometime. Um, and then on the back of your on the back of your grid is going to be the care and instructions. Uh, so this is more details. We list each type of plant, and um, if it's a seed or seedling that we're giving you, and then how many per square foot in the next column. And then over here we have instructions. So um, how much sun they like how far apart to plant them, um, what the temperatures they prefer and the water requirements, um, and then also just checking for um, certain pests or diseases that might be prone, that type of plant might be prone to. Um, and then also some of it has like how long until it's ready to be harvested. So that's a really helpful guide that you can use for your fall um, planting. And um, on the digital version in your email, uh, some of these I have links to the actual type of seeds so that you could uh, look up even more information on that if you need to. Okay. And also at Valley Verde, we really care about um, making our gardens um, appropriate to the types of food that you like to eat. So. Um, somebody from our Vietnamese group is not going to necessarily want to eat the same foods as somebody from our Latino group. So we have different grids for these different groups and um, we hope that as we do our evaluations and focus study uh, groups that um, each community will have access to nutritious food that is something that they like to cook with and um, that they will actually want to eat uh, because it's part of their culture. So uh, that's a little bit about that, uh, the grids. Okay. Okay, so the fall and winter crops are suited for cool weather conditions. Examples that can be grown in the Bay Area include brassicas. So that's gonna be your broccoli, your cauliflower, uh, your cabbage and Brussels sprouts and your root vegetables such as carrots, garlic, onions, potatoes, beets, radishes, leafy greens, uh, like bok choy, uh, spinach, chard, lettuce, mustard greens, kale, among many others. So due to the cooler temperatures of fall and winter and in the increase of rain, our fall crops have different needs. Okay, so before I move on to that next part about the care of the plants, let's just take a look real quick here. You can see on the left the example of the square foot gardening grid. Uh, this was one of our uh, participants' beds, and uh, they used uh, wood stakes. You can do like that, um, where you like actually make 
um, a wood grid and then you can just either place it over your bed while you're planting and then move it to the next one if you have more than one or just leave it there. Um, another method we've done is using string uh, and like little tack nails to tie it to and that will help you cordon off. It's mainly helpful when you're first um, kind of getting the hang of square foot gardening and then uh, over time, you might not need to rely on um, the lines because you'll know spatially where to put things and how far. So, um, for example, as you can see here, um, four lettuce in each square box, and you don't put them all together. You want to space them in each corner um, spread out. And so that's the suggested requirement for the plant to have its optimal amount of space for the roots, um, for the nutrients that it needs to take from the soil um, and that type of thing. So we've got our cut and come again on here. So that's the cool part about lettuce, kale, spinach, pak choy, and mustard. You can cut them leaving one inch remaining and they will grow again. Um, and so that's, you can also do the pinch off the outside and um, it'll just keep growing up through the middle. Either way works. Um, I kind of like to do the cut and come again where you just cut the whole thing because it's enough for like a salad or a full meal as opposed to just a few um, added in. All right. Okay. So watering in the fall and the winter. So in the heat of the summer months, it was recommended to water gardens daily or every other day. However, once the temperatures cool and precipitation increases or begins, you will need to water less frequently. Young plants can be watered every two or three days and mature plants once or twice a week if given a good soak. If it rains, you do not need to water your plants unless it was very short and light rain. Check the soil with your finger to ensure that the soil is moist. So two to three inches deep. So up to that second knuckle or all the way. That's how far you want um, the soil to be deep when you're testing it with your finger. So cool weather pests and diseases. Due to the cooler temperatures and increased moisture, mold and mildew are common diseases to look out for. Prevent disease by monitoring the moisture levels of your soil. It should be moist but not saturated because that will drown the roots and then the edges of your, uh, the leaves on your plants are gonna start to go black and brown and slowly come back because it's dying. It, the, the oxygen can't reach the outermost part of the, the leaf in the plant. Um, okay. Uh, if mold or mildew is noticed, uh, like I just noticed powdery mildew on my pumpkins, um, you're going to want to act quickly by spraying a diluted mixture of neem oil, which I will give you the rest. Oh, the recipe's right on your screen. Um, um, and clipping off the affected leaves. So um, I have not done my neem oil. I did. Last night I snipped off um, some of the leaves that had the powdery mildew, which is just this white um, powdery substance on top of the leaves. It's pretty obvious. Um, and so I clipped those off and then I can, tonight after um, closer to sunset, I'll spray the neem oil. And the reason you want to wait till after um, like the evening is because the pollinators are out during the day and um, some insects, uh, bees and butterflies might be impacted by the neem oil. It's not a chemical that's harmful to the soil, um, but it could kill um, beneficial insects as well as um, the pests so or the diseases. So what I would do is spray it in the evening and then in the morning you want to rinse your plant uh, like just um, spray some water on it to wash off any of the dead bugs and to keep it clean for um, the be beneficial pollinators. Okay, and also cinnamon can be used to treat many plant diseases. So for both of these, I have uh, the formula for um, what you would want to do to um, make your recipe there um, for these organic sprays. Um, it's pretty simple and easy to do. Um, so cinnamon spray is really cool because it's a fungicide uh, control uh, that makes um, this organic spray for your plant. So stir some cinnamon into warm water, allow it to steep overnight, then you're going to strain the liquid through a coffee filter and put the results into a spray bottle. 
you're going to spray the stems and the leaves of the affected plants and miss the potting soil in the plants that have any mushroom problems. Um, mushrooms are good in your compost but not really in your garden. <laughs> so uh, for watering it's best to use drip irrigation or to water at the base of the plant towards the roots to prevent prevent excessive moisture from sitting on the leaves of the plants, which leads to mold and mildews. Um, additionally, sn slugs and snails prefer wet conditions, so be sure to water, or excuse me, be sure to watch for their presence in your garden or evidence of chewed leaves and slimy trails. A ring of coffee grounds, diacotomous earth, or crushed eggshells or ne nematodes around the base of your plant will deter some pests. To avoid root rot from overwatering, schedule watering by checking the weather forecast. So, um, you know, just be sure if you know it's going to be raining that you're not going to be out there watering prior uh, for that. So, another thing that can happen in uh, the winter gardens uh, aphids, which are small insects, they can be green, white, gray, black, or even yellow. They feed on the sap or liquid inside a plant's leaves or stems and can cause the plant to die or stunt its growth. Aphids can be troublesome in the fall and winter and are especially attracted to the brassica plants, which again is our cauliflower, our broccoli, our cabbage, most of the ones that are the cool weather plants that aphids also really like. So if you see aphids, you can spray them off with a hose or remove them by hand. Stay vigilant until the threat passes by checking daily. If caught early, it's easier to ward off aphids than if they have covered your plants with eggs. If spraying or hand picking do not work, you can use the neem oil spray, um, which the recipe is there on your screen. Uh, spray your plants in the evening, as I mentioned, after pollinators have left for the day. Spray with water the following morning to remove any dead aphids and repeat until the infestation is under control. So. The reason the neem oil is better than um, some of the commercial chemical um, you know, pesticides that are out there is because it's not going to damage or have chemicals in the soil that are bad for our health. Um, it's a natural oil and it um, is not toxic for, uh, for us. Um, so it's a little bit about our fall winter gardens. So our climate change topic is transportation and pollution. So it's interesting to note how the global coronavirus pandemic has affected the climate. People all over the world have spent more time at home, less time traveling, and the result has been that ecosystems are seeing evidence of recovery from pollution and increased biodiversity. Yet this shouldn't be a reason to ease up on our efforts to protect the environment. Rather, we should see it as evidence that when we take actions to reduce our carbon footprint, we can positively impact the environment. Transportation is one of our one aspect of our carbon footprint which we can control. Instead of driving our car to work each day by ourselves, we can opt to carpool, take the bus, walk if possible, or work from home if that is an option, uh, which many of us have, um, you know, been able to do given the coronavirus. So moving forward, maybe that's something that you can um, discuss with your employer uh, if that's an option. Uh, in a fast-paced environment, it can be hard to see the value of making these changes, but over time, it will add up to reduced pollution and increased physical health for you and your family. Of course, not everyone has access to a vehicle, so many people are already using more equal-friendly forms of transportation. If this is so, way to go, keep it up, that's amazing. Um, some people may not have the ability to control what vehicles they use. They may have a work issued vehicle or they may not have the capacity to purchase a more equal friendly option. This is understandable and if this is the case for you, there are other ways you can reduce your carbon purchase um, footprint. Um, and so another aspect of transportation pollution comes from the purchases we make. The retail company Amazon is incredibly convenient. However, sometimes products shipped from overseas are not locally sourced. This creates a lot of pollution and because we are ordering from our computers, we're disconnected from the actual impact of the purchase. 
Shopping local helps reduce pollution from transportation, helps small businesses, and boosts the local economy. So take a moment to think about, um, finish this sentence. This week I will reduce transportation pollution by what? Can you ride your bikes more? Can you walk um, somewhere that, like if you have to walk to the post office or um, to the store? Maybe these are things you already do, and if so, that's wonderful. Or maybe you can commit to um, shopping local. It's going to put money into your community and reduce the amount of pollution. If you order something that was made in China, it has to be shipped on, you know, either a barge or, you know, a ship come to our country. That creates pollution, just the transport. And then it has to be driven to the store. Then it from the store, you drive to the store, pick it up, drive home. So that's a lot of like emissions from vehicles um, and pollution that if you instead just shopped from a locally uh, sourced artisan. I just went to the flea market this time. I haven't lived in the San Jose for very long and I went to um, the big flea market that we have here and there were so many local artisans and it's a better cost. It's um, sourcing things locally. Uh, there was a furniture ma maker who did beautiful work and um, it's much more affordable. And um, I don't know, I wish I had gone sooner, but at least I know now. And um, so, and there's also things like buy sell swaps on Facebook um, where you can um, buy gently used things from neighbors or you can swap things with neighbors. Um, and it's just a really great way to reduce our pollution and do our part to help our environment because um, we've been noticing at Valley Verde, this is an especially hot year. We've had, you know, obviously the fires have been very bad. Um, and so our, our environment's kind of calling out to us that something's wrong. And so we really need to pay attention and listen and do our part to uh, make things better. So, in conclusion, uh, our announcements, uh, just to please talk to your coordinator about your planting distribution day. Um, you should have received an email by now through Sign Up Genius. Um, we're having people sign up in 15 minute increments to receive their plants. Um, and so please check with your coordinator to see what the plan is for your site. Um, there, there are some differences. Some sites will be bringing plants to and other sites will be picking up uh, from us at our uh, new location in downtown San Jose. So um, please talk to your coordinator if you have any questions. Um, for our graduates, we've emailed or we've mailed the postcards out to you. So if you don't get that, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you're going to want to plant your seedlings the same day that you pick them up to avoid them drying out, dying, or becoming root bound. Uh, you're going to want to follow your square foot gardening guidelines. If you overcrowd your plants, they're not going to grow as big. They're not going to be able to produce uh, as good of a harvest for you. So please follow the guidelines. If you have questions, you're always welcome to email us at info at valleyverde.org or contact us on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, we're on both of those social media platforms as well.